Boys and girls, how's it hanging? It is your boy, BQ. It is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review for April 11, 2024. I was so proud of myself. I'm known for dropping some pretty late reviews during the week. I was so proud of myself because I watched the episode of Impact earlier than I typically do. I got up early sun, uh, excuse me, Saturday morning, and I recorded the review. Audio came out pretty bad. I was um, I was accidentally running another program up against StreamYard, eating up the RAM, and it just sounded pretty bad. And I was disappointed because you know what? I got the in, the review done fairly quickly. Thought it was a good review, and uh, now we're doing it all over again. So that's not definitely not the way that I prefer to operate but that's the way we're going to operate so we're going to talk this episode of impact from this past week i don't think they're putting out the best television right now but i do think the rebellion card is shaping out quite nicely uh the the build is is okay it's better than some of the builds we've gotten for bigger pay-per-views in the past it's probably better than a lot of the rebellion builds rebellion is is my opinion, the fourth, well, I, I think it's most opinions. It's like fourth on the priority list when it comes to the company. And uh, they've had some big matches. You know, I think that might be where Tessa Blanchard won her title. I think that's where Kenny Omega beat Rich Swan. So th- there's been some like big matches. But when you're talking about the top to bottom card, um, Akeem Fullerton on uh, released the top 10 worst rebellion uh, matches article the other day. And they were, I mean, they were like 10 stinkers. Like there's one that like one or two that you could be like, well, I, I kind of like that match. I mean, fucking stinkers. And it was like, whoa, what were those doing on pay-per-views? I don't see matches like that this time around. So I think the the card looks pretty good. But the buzz behind it is, I mean, Mike Gilbert was saying this. It's ice cold right now. Uh, and, you know, when, when they am- announced they were going back to the Palms, like, that's cool for me. It's 13, 14 minutes away. Like, that's fine for me as a fan. I don't give a shit. Uh, but I really questioned doing the same venue twice in a row, and it really came off like, Oh, well, we did so good the first time. We're just going to do it again. Like there was a big marketing push behind the rebrand of TNA that time around. And obviously Scott Demore was in place as well. So when I question this on Twitter, you know, the faceless trolls, Barbara, Barbara Dang and all them, you know, oh, no, that Scott Demore is not the reason that they packed that place. It was. um, they're, they're listing these employees, man. The, the marks know these employees that you're like, who the fuck are you talking about? They start listing all these people. Oh, it's the, them and them. I'm like, okay, motherfuckers. Scott No More was the head of the snake, okay? He, he was the head of this whole thing. He was the face of this whole thing. TNA is faceless right now. As a brand, it is faceless. Not, not with the wrestlers going, but as far as, you know, executives, people in charge. When you're watching WWE, like you know there's Triple H, you know there's Tony Khan with AEW, you know there's Billy Corrigan, you know there's Court Bauer with AEW. TNA is faceless. It's it's there's no connection to whoever's in charge from a from the fan standpoint. Like you knew Scott Demore was there and you felt Scott Demore's passion. That there you don't have that this time around. There is no social media campaign behind rebellion rebellion is just a name there's no why did we call this pay-per-view rebellion but there's there's no creative campaign behind it and i'll give them i'll give them this it's easier to do a creative social media campaign behind the rebrand of tna it's much easier to do that it's a hundred times easier to do that than just your your a, B, C, D, P, <laughs> your D pay-per-view in the year. But that's why you bring in professionals, like real, real professionals, re- people who really know what the hell they're doing from a social media marketing standpoint. 
and then a you know marketing in general and a promotion standpoint. That's why you bring in people who really know what the fuck they're doing. Because when you just resort back to, you know, watch Tomatanga's debut or the, uh, the the Cody Rhodes clip that they posted every single Cody Rhodes moment in one in one hour long video. It's a fucking joke. You're you're going back to that. And uh, you know, no one's no one's talking. The fans who watch no matter what, all the way from the marks to the casuals, they're we're we're excited. That's cool. You know, we're we're down for any impact pay per view because we know they're always pretty good. It's very rare that they do one of their big four pay per views and overall it's a bad show. It's probably not since Bound for Glory might have been twenty seventeen, maybe. It was the one where like uh Eli Drake had an open challenge, and it was answered by uh, man, who uh, that one fuck that uh, chinless dude from WWE. I'm trying to think what other matches were on there. It was just like one of the worst fucking shows in the world. It was in New York, though. I remember that much. So they haven't been putting on bad shows, but as far as like those those wrestling fans that are on a bubble about, do I want to get TNA this time around? They, they probably don't even know this pay-per-view is coming. So um, everything that this new ownership and leadership, I shouldn't say ownership, but the new leadership, this, this statement they put out of everything that was going to happen, has not happened. The show looks worse than ever. This particular episode, I haven't watched impact on my actual physical tv in over a year i've always watched on my phone i've watched a few episodes on my laptop but for the most part i watch on my phone because maybe i'm at work Uh, sometimes i watch when i'm at the gym sometimes um, my kids are hogging our downstairs tv my wife's upstairs so i'll just kind of go to our family room try to find a quiet area pull it up on my phone and watch this is the first time I watched on my TV. My wife worked late on Friday, and I said, you know what? Let's fire this son of a bitch up. And I did. From a production standpoint, it's worse than I thought. The way that I, I've been talking about, I'm not even talking about the color levels. Those were shit as usual. I'm not even going to get into all that. The The transitional cuts are sloppy. There um, and maybe maybe it's this episode. Maybe it's this camera crew. Maybe it switches from because you know I can't, I've been saying lately no no two episodes look the same. You can't tell me. Take the last three episodes. None of them look the same. They feel the same because every episode does kind of feel the same. Which I don't mean that in a positive way. Uh, but they they all look different. Like one looks like it's edited well. One doesn't. And then one's okay, one's horrible. There's always a horrible every like four or five weeks. There's just one that is so disgustingly bad. And this this was, I don't know, middle of the pack. Because you could see the crowd a little bit last night. So it was the middle of the pack. But the cuts, man, the transitional cuts were so bad. And there was uh there was moments where they've never they haven't done this in a while. They they had they used to a little bit in the Orlando days which tells me maybe it's just a new crew. But there was times where Jay would be introducing the wrestler and it would cut to the wrestler. They're already halfway down the ramp. Like the the entrance is part of the presentation, especially this current ramp that they have, I think looks really good. I love that they moved that tunnel dead center as opposed to off to the left or right, whatever it was. I think it looks great. And I think it looks it's a good visual seeing them walk through it. There was half these entrances, man, that they were just standing in the in the middle of the aisle already. There was a part when Santino was doing the the um, what do you call uh, the contract signing, and they cut to it. He's he, I mean, they cut to it so quickly. He started talking immediately when they went to his face. There was no like lead up into it, nothing, like, and it came off real MLW ish, and uh, and then you know the lighting. <laughs> there was, so there was the part where Santino was walking around backstage confronted by Ash by Elegance and he crosses over and 
you know what what I would say with the lighting is that you have to put it at like 45 degree angles because it can't it helps cancel out the shadow. The other thing to that though is that you have to have some kind of distance. The lights cannot be right in front of your face, but they can't be too far either because then you then you have no lighting. So like professionals know how to find okay, here's the right distance so that shadows are minimalized, we're not lighting up their face. It just looks good. So there's a part where Santino's walking, and he's he's literally for about a second blinded by the light because it's so close to his face. He he was I don't remember exactly. He was kind of like shimming around a corner, and then you just see the the light blind him, and I'm just like, this fucking company, man. Um, but as far as the episode goes, I thought there was good, and I thought there was bad. I didn't think there was much. In between on this whole thing, there were some segments that I thought were excellent, including the very beginning, Hammerstone and Alexander brawling. I would love to know from someone in the arena how this brawl occurred, how it originated. I mean, I don't know if it was Hammerstone was coming down to the arena to cut, cut a promo and Josh attacked him from behind and then they started filming. I, I don't know what it was. I'm curious to know, though. It reminded me of when they debuted on Destination America and the debut kicked off with everyone just brawling in the arena for no reason. <laughs> I, I, it just reminded me of that. I'm not saying these guys were brawling for no reason because they clearly weren't. But they're doing a very good job with with these guys and their story. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know how that how that brawl originated. When I was turning Impact on, I was already dreading the slow motion intro with the highlights from last week and C4 Spike and uh, Severn and Bailey. I, I mean, I was already just dreading it. So this was really refreshing to open up the show. Very, very refreshing. It was something different. And that's why when I said earlier, it's not a positive thing when I say every episode feels the same. I've been saying this for a couple of years. The format is, is unchanged. It just it just everything feels the same. And this was switching up the format a little bit, made it feel different. So I liked that quite a bit. And the reason I'm saying is, you know, dreading the intro, and I've said this many times as well, is um I so when I watch the show, let me throw this out there first. I never watch straight. So I'll watch it on Ultimate Insiders, but I do it in like 30 minute clips. I'll do 30 minutes, I'll take a break do another 30 minutes, and usually come back to the last 30 minutes like the day later. Mainly it's because, and I've explained before, it's not really Impact's fault or TNA's fault. I get annoyed very easily by people in general. Uh, It's just Hannafin and um, Raywald's voices. It's not the content of what they're saying. It's just their voices. I just can't take them for that long. I can handle like 30 minutes at a time, maybe an hour at a time. I just can't watch a whole hour and a half wrestling show so that's why like when they do the monthly specials i always call them that i know they don't the tna plus shows my reviews always come out so late because it takes me forever to get through it because i can't watch three hours of i just in general can't watch three hours of wrestling but i can also not listen to them for three hours so i keep breaking it up and it just takes me forever to get through the show it's kind of i have to be better about it I don't know if I should turn the volume down, watch it on mute, what I got to do to knock that stuff. But I do have a hard time listening to them, you know, throughout the show. But I love this opening brawl. I thought it was really, really well done. It, it, um, there is blood in this feud. So, you know, man, what was I, when I went, when I went to that, when I famously went to that episode of collision with my family, cause you know, veterans getting free said, let's go, let's do this. There was a pull apart brawl between FTR and um, Black Blackpool Combat Club, but they had no feud up to that point. Like it was actually the beginning of their feud, and it, it was the worst thing in the world. Like I think the Blackpool Combat Club just beat some of the CMLL guys, and CMLL came. They said it was this big partnership. They didn't win a single match the entire time. Uh, so Black Bull Combat Club wins. FTR comes down to like cut a promo. 
they brawl within 10 seconds. And then with those 10 seconds, the the AEW jobbers collectively run from backstage to break up the brawl like they weren't just standing there waiting in gorilla. And there was no heat behind it. And it was so stupid. I was like, why are these guys having a pull apart brawl? It, so this makes sense. This is where you use a fucking pull apart brawl because you've built building for weeks up to this point. There was a down. Uh, there was a down in this and it was Tommy dreamer coming out. They cannot help themselves. They're in Philadelphia. He comes out wearing a long sleeve hoodie with a Philadelphia 76ers over it, a uh, uh, 76ers shirt over it, looking like he's pushing 375. And he, and he comes in and just, I, I didn't have a big problem with the promo. He did, he's usually pretty good when he talks. I didn't have a problem with he, what he was telling Hammerstone. You know, it was a little playing up to the audience, like the greatest arena in the world. Like, okay, sorry, Barclay Center. You know, sorry, Madison Square Garden. <laughs> I mean, didn't they have a, a Kickstarter um, or GoFundMe or whatever like several years ago to keep this arena alive? I mean, just playing up to the audience a little, telling it, telling them that, you know, how this is the most uh, honest audience in the world. Like that's probably a bad thing to point out. We'll get to that in this next, show, this next match. But for the most part, Tommy dreamer does pretty good when he talks because he's not, he's a good actor. You know, he uh, he's genuine when he speaks. I don't think he's the warmest on screen character at this point in his career. Just like I used to say about Scott no but he comes out and I'm like, is Tommy dreamer part of the management? Like, why is he out here? Because TNA is faceless, like I said. There's no Scott Namor. There's no executives on screen, which is, you know, can be good or bad, but the company is fucking faceless. And you can't bring Santino out for everything. And I, I remember they used him as a, a Anthem ex, a executive on screen years ago. They could have used Gail Kim. They could have popped the internet and brought Dixie Carter for a segment, but it was Tommy Dreamer. So he comes out and okay, first of all, I Tommy Dreamer can be the authority figure on this show. I don't care. I really don't. I don't dislike Tommy Dreamer. I dislike the blip break glass in case case of emergency use of Tommy Dreamer. Of just bringing him out every time, hey, we need someone to play this role. Let's bring in the man of many hats. And I don't think the fan base in general likes that either. Like just just say, hey, Tommy Dreamer is now in charge. Like when they said when that rumor came out, Tommy Dreamer was in charge of creative. Like people are like, okay, cool. You know, people don't like dislike him. They just dislike the way they use him on screen. But he comes out and and I thought what he said to Hammerstone was good. And and you knew what was happening. You knew Hammerstone was going to take this fool out. Uh, obviously, they had to have an exec who could exec who could wrestle for this. Uh, I would have popped big time if he put Scott Demore in a torture rack. <laughs> Let me tell you, but he's he's telling him, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, just go and have the best wrestling match you can have. Show these people what you can do. Blah 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 blah. Hammerstone's like, oh cool, cool, I get it. Tommy Dreamer turns around like we knew he was going to. Hammerstone hits him from behind, picks him up, and puts him in a torture rack. He looked like he was carrying a body pillow full of a bunch of individual sacks of shit. It was like a bunch of a body pillow full of individual pillows full with freaking hippopotamus poop. It was the, one of the worst visuals on this screen in a while from a wrestling standpoint. I was embarrassed watching this. <sighs> So um, that was the down, the down there. You know, there was a lot of ups. That was the down. Crazy Steve took on Laredo Kid in front of the most honest audience in wrestling. They didn't care about this match. Neither did I. They had Laredo Kid do a sit down with Tom Hannafin last week, which was very well done. Very well done. It's the first time we've heard Laredo Kid in eight years speak. And his English is decent. That's why I'm like, this guy could be cutting promos this whole time, you know? Uh, 
But the problem was the people in the arena didn't see that. So to them, Laredo Kid is what he's been to us all these years and is a random AAA person you just throw in there. Like they just did with Tommy Streamer in the previous segment. Random ass dude, throw him in, break glass, case of emergency. That's what Laredo Kid is. He falls into that category of people I've listed before, the suicides and uh, and and um, Petey Williams and and Caleb Conley's that you just got to bring in when you need someone. Uh, and that's what Laredo Kid has been. Apparently, he had a, a digital media title shop. It got hurt. Like I don't, I barely fucking remember that. But what they did last week was good. And it's a lot of the reason that I say I wish they would build stuff a little bit longer. But I get why they do it. The, the problem is, you know, because you never know who's in and out of the company, right? But they build the storylines within the set of tapings. If they had the ability to create, to to take more, I mean, except for the major storylines, obviously. But if they had the ability with some of these mid-card storylines to carry them from one set of taping to the other... I think they would hit better on TV. So I think there would be more interest. So because the live audience didn't see anything about Laredo Kid's sit down with Tom Hannafin over music, by the way, they didn't know why they were watching this match. They couldn't care fucking less. And I really wasn't into it either. And I love Crazy Steve. The match was what it was. It was okay. And then it finished in a DQ. After Laredo Kid, remember your first match is supposed to be the attention grabber for an episode. Laredo Kid, because he was mad crazy, Steve was trying to pull his mask off, pushes the goof ref, the goof ref Frank, pulls him to the pushes him to the ground, and gets a disqualification. So they're going to keep this going. The, the live audience was like, "What in the f is going on here?" When have you ever seen a freaking disqualification in a random match? I you know, I shouldn't say that. But a match like this, like an X Division style match, you know, digital media, like you just it just feels like a match on the card. And then they give you a DQ letting you know this shit's gonna continue. I don't have a problem with it continuing, but it's just the way they kind of like went about it very quickly, just out of the blue. Laredo Kid gets a video package, wrestles for the title, DQ. Just there wasn't even time for people to take it all in. So the match was fine. The match was fine. They're going to keep going. Um, I know Crazy Steve does have a digital media title match at the pay per view because he told me that. He just didn't tell me against who. So I don't know if it's going to be this. They're clearly going to keep going. Crazy Steve is not booked for under siege. It looks like he's trying to take independent bookings. So that kind of tells me he's going to lose the belt because every single Impact Plus show, they defend every title, even though I always say you don't need to. You don't have the roster to do that. You know, I think people would appreciate if under siege was headlined by the X Division Championship one day or the Tag Team Championships and the World Tide. The World Champion just had the night off, you know, but instead everything's on the line. So... It just tells you he's not he's not winning. Whoever his opponent is, whether it's Laredo Kid, which if you put the title on Laredo Kid, I mean, you might as well bury it in the backyard. What is he going to do with the digital media championship? The digital media championship is supposed to, it was supposed to be this cutting edge title. It's been held by people who don't have social media, by people who can't see, and now it's going to be by by people who don't cut promos on TV, who, who speak English as a second language. I mean, who else are you going to put this title on? You're going to put it on PCO, who doesn't speak except yelling his opponent's names in the hallways? This is the worst championship in the world, I swear to God. I'm talking way too long about it. I have another upload coming about the Digital Media Championship, tying it into what WWE is doing right now. That's, that's to come later. Machine Guns were backstage. They had to course correct on the story that they were doing. And they're so, oh, you know, we're better as a, a, a team, whatever the hell they said. Editing looked like shit. I didn't care. They're gone. I don't care. ABC took on first class. Now I start caring. ABC, uh, 
I've always said I don't really like the ABC that much. But I think it's just I don't like the matches that they're in. You know, like when they wrestle the Grizzly Young Vets, I'm like, man, it's just going to be a bunch of spots. They wrestle the Rascals. I'm just envisioning a bunch of spots, and it's just like I don't really like matches like that. But with First Class, they are the kind of tag team that I've I've said in the past that I really like because there's real uh, big contrast in style and look. And I thought this was great. There was a one botch in there. Is it is it okay for wrestling fans to say botch because we can't do what they do? There was a mishap. There was there was a misstep. AJ Francis was doing a double suplex, and I wanted to see him complete the double suplex. I thought that would have got heat, and I thought it would have been impressive. And the the spot was for ABC to get out of it, and it was kind of messed up. He pretty much completed the suplex on Chris Bay. Uh, Ace Austin stumbled his way out of it, fell on the ground. They both had to wait for each other to gather themselves. And then they did like a double super kick on AJ Francis. And this ultimately finished with Rich Swan, who is doing great work as a heel. Great. Just the, the facial expressions and everything coming off like a just like a little pest next to the Suge Knight character is fucking great. He ultimately when he gets the roll up, pulls the tights, handful of tights, and they get the win. I thought this was really well done. It takes us away from the storyline of ABC possibly having dissension a little bit and just watching them wrestle for what they are and now makes us think, oh maybe they are going to be okay going forward. You know, that's that's good storytelling there. That's good creative. Um, Joe Hendry comes out after this. I like Joe Hendry. I like Joe Hendry's first run a lot better with the company when he's with Gato, Gato, Grado, and Katie Lee, and the story that they were doing, um, the theme song, everything. I like I liked what they were doing. He's coming off right now, really cheesy, really fucking corny. And he always gets the upper hand, which is what bothers me. There's There was once or twice that he's been left flat on his ass due to AJ Francis. But like for the most part, Joe Hendry's the one laughing in the end. But he's starting to come off very corny. He did this entire Fresh print, press Prince of Bel-Air. Did I say that right? Fresh Prince of Bel-Air opening theme. And it was so cringe. And he go, and, and I mean, it worked because the impact audience is kind of old, including myself. It worked. He went through that whole thing just to use the Uncle Phil line at the end. And then, I don't know, like AJ and, and Rich Swan displayed fake outrage. I thought it was really bad. After a match that I enjoyed quite a bit, I thought this was really bad. And then... They announced that it's going to be Joe Hendry versus Rich Swan at Rebellion, which is weird because First Class was just put together as a team. You would just kind of think there was going to be a tag team match involved here. What I think is going to happen, because I said this last week, I don't expect AJ Francis. This is complete speculation on my part. I don't expect him to be one of the, the consistent wrestlers for First Class going forward. I think it's going to be Rich Swan and someone else. It could be Chris Bay. Um, I really think they need to add, add Jack Price to this group so he can have a similar role that Sheldon Jean had with with um, uh, Kenny King. Or Sheldon Jean would be a great addition as well. A great addition to this. But ultimately, because he has the Suge Knight character, I expect him to be more of a manager than in-ring. So I have a feeling that there's going to be someone that gets involved in this match. Like I said, it could be Chris Bay. I have a feeling there's someone that gets involved in this match that joins first class. Because the one-on-one -on -one dynamic is really weird here. A, lot, a few people have said this. like, But I'll also say that this has been, in my opinion, I know people are going to say Hammerstone and Alexander. What they're doing with AJ Francis has been the best story to the best storyline to me. 
because they've been doing it since the beginning of 2024, since the first match of explosion of Swan versus Hendry. And it's been continually doing something every single week. I'm giving AJ, AJ Francis props for this. I've heard his interviews. He's a very creative guy. Every week, it's been progressing. And at one point, it was the only storyline the company was doing. <laughs> I pointed this out back when it was happening. like, there's one story going on. Everyone else is just wrestling. So I thought that I just think they've been doing a good job with this. I've been I've been enjoying it. So for that reason, I'm going to look forward to this match. But Rich Swan's one of my favorite wrestlers. So I'm not looking forward to Joe Hendry doing a video on him. So I'm probably going to boo Joe Hendry at freaking Rebellion. I might put my hands up. I'm in the front row. So I got to put my hands up for the entrance. Got to be a bit, bit of a wrestling mark for a bit. You know, you always got to when you go to a wrestling show. But I'm not, I don't want him to, you know. I remember I went to a show, the uh, Anaheim Convention Center when I was a kid. I went because Coco Beware was in a battle royal. And he was advertised for it. And he didn't show up. Or they didn't use him. So uh, finally I got to meet him in Indianapolis last month. Got to tell him that story. But I was just such a huge fan of his as a kid. And I was so disappointed. I had like... I was in like the fourth row. I was waiting for Coco and everyone comes out. But anyway, the point of my story is you always got to be a bit of a mark at a wrestling show. I mean, they announced Hulk Hogan because he was on the card and I'm cheering like, oh, I hate Hulk Hogan. I've hated Hulk Hogan since I've ever first saw him wrestle. But you just kind of play into the baby face and heel dynamics sometimes when you're at a wrestling show. So I'll put my hands up for Joe Hendry. Um, maybe I'll Maybe I'll join those like five people that are on screen every single show. Uh, maybe they'll get BQ this time around, uh, but I'm going to be booing for him in this match. Trust me. I'm a Rich Swan guy through and through. Do I like all the black wrestlers only? Is that what it is? I thought about that the other day. I was like, man, Moose, Rich Swan, you know, Kenny King when he was around. Like I was thinking of all the, you know, Jonathan Gresham. I was like, is that what it is? No, it was Steve Macklin's my dude. That's, that's my number one right there. Um, what do we got next? What do we got next, folks? Santino's backstage. This is where you see him get blinded by the light. And uh, Ash by Elegance and the concierge, Ice George Iceman are back there. Um, before I get into this, what are you guys' thoughts on, on Ash by Elegance so far? So what I was saying when, when they brought her on in the company was that the knockout division is, is such an, in such a bad place right now that her gimmick needed to be a home run. It needed a hit. I don't know if it has. I'm still into it. Um, I'm un unapologi unapologetically a fan of hers for whatever reason. I have been since I've ever first saw her. So I'm still into it. I think I think the Iceman's role in this is really good. I think he's really good at what he does. I wish that I could speak like him without stumbling over my words. Like, this dude just rattles shit off. It's crazy. But I do wonder from you guys, is it hitting for you if, if, it's, if it's a miss? She did a podcast interview with I don't remember who. And she was, you know, she was talking about, you're going to see sides of me you've never seen before. And the interviewer was like, okay, well, what's an example? And she couldn't give one. <laughs> she was just like, well, you just have to watch. There's just, you know, well, like, like what, you know? You'll you'll see. I'm not seeing. With the exception of her doing the Swanton, which I think she does pretty well. I didn't like her previous finisher. I, that's one of the, I fucking hate that move. I hate any time anyone does that. For you don't know what I'm talking about. It's like the miracle in progress Mike Bennett would use. I've just never liked that finisher. So I do like that. And she does show off her athleticism. And I think in the right type of match with Jordan Grace, it can be really good. But we're not seeing it so far. It's not. It hasn't been like particularly good in the ring. That match was the match with Zia Brookside was one of the worst knockouts matches. I mean, since fucking Rebel and uh, what was her name, Martinez, whatever, something Martinez. I can't remember her name. This was. It was bad. It was very bad. And there, Zia Brookside's great. You know, there was just no chemistry in that match. It was. It was bad. It was very very bad. And there taking their time pushing her knockouts title match. I was sure, I think most people were, she was going to get a title shot at Rebellion. 
I think she's going to win when she gets it. I'm I'm pulling back on that a little bit, and I'll I'll get into why when we get to Steph Delander here in a sec. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think it still is a possibility, but I'm starting to think the title changes within the division might be a little different here. But they were basically saying, well, Steph Delander filled in for me. Uh, I so that should be my title spot. I'm ready to go, you know. And of course, it doesn't work that way. So they're very much dragging out, dragging this out, which is good because I think you need time to develop the character a little bit. And she needs some op opponents that she can have a good match with because it's been three squash matches and a very bad match with Zaya Brookside. So they've they've got to get her some reps against people who can wrestle, you know. And then they show the action figures, which look really really good. I will believe it when I see it. I know they're taking pre-orders. They've done that before. I will believe it when I see those fucking physical action figures on Twitter and people are holding them and look, I got mine in the mail. But they look pretty cool. They look different than most wrestling action figures coming out. I'm not really a collector of action figures. I have a one of the little Rich Swan, not, not Funkos, you know, but there's like the, the little like plush, I forgot what they're called. I have an autograph one with Rich, autograph box with Rich Swan on it, uh, but I don't really care collect that kind of stuff. I'm, I might buy these though. I might, I might. They are they are pretty cool. Um, then Ali has a backstage segment with the Grizzly Young Veterans, and they look like stars. I am coming around on the Grizzly Young Vets. At first, I was kind of like they do nothing for me. I still barely know what their names are or who's who, but uh, I'm starting to enjoy now that I'm here. Hearing them talk more, uh, they look like stars, especially next to Ali. I need someone to let me know in the comments too. I'm sure many of you will, because I missed this episode. Because I think it was right before uh, sacrifice or something, and I just didn't bother. Ali was with the Good Hands before they teamed up in a match, and I know they lost. Did he fire them? Did he get rid of them? Because I know they're a jobber team, so I can totally see why he like, hey, get away from me. Let me get this like stud tag team right here. So you guys got to explain that to me a little. But I'm coming around on these guys. Jake something walks up looking like he's just in his wrestling gear. And I'm not saying Jake needs to be in a suit like these guys. But these guys look like stars. And Jake, every single time on TV, is just in his wrestling trunks. He has a bland entrance. He has a bland name. I'm not going to say he has a bland look because he looks great physically, but he has bland shorts. There's so much about this that is just, just screams regular guy. His name is literally like just being a regular guy. I, I was walking past someone the other day at work and they were like, yeah, Jake something. I thought they were talking about TNA, but they're really just talking about some dude. And that's how he comes off as some dude. They've got to find a way and he's just always yelling and they just got to find a way to, to just make him a little more personable, but just to come off like a bigger deal on screen. You know, God forbid he walks around with his own t-shirt that they want to fucking push. That just says something on it or, you know, you know, God fucking forbid, but they, they've just got to find a way to um just update his presentation. Like they just make him look like a, like a star. You know what I mean? You guys agree with me on that? I think that, I, I think that's very necessary. For his character. And the problem with Jake, it's not his fault, is that it's start and stop with him. They heat him up. It's like they heat him up when they need him to to challenge for the X Division Championship. They've done it many times. He's like they just temporarily heat him up and then he'll disappear forever. And I think the company has to do a better job of I'm not saying they do a horrible job of it, but just say, yo, we want Jake something to wrestle for the X Division Championship in six months. What can we do to get him there over the next five? Rather than, okay, who's the challenger this month? And then heat him up. So that's why with Hammerstone and, and Alexander, by the way, that's a last man standing match now, which I think is the right call. I think it needed a stipulation. It's a bit of a garbage match, but... 
Hammerstone needs to win that match, and he needs to win clean. I don't know how clean you can win in a last man standing match. There's no rules, but you understand what I'm saying? Like, no outside, no nothing, no bullshit. Like, he just needs to beat Josh. Because I think they need to start building him for his eventual world title run, because it's going to happen. But it's easier to heat up a baby face and get him wins, I think. I mean, clearly, they're doing it with Jake something. Than it than it is with a heel. You can build a heel's character up very quickly, but the heel has to also win matches. Kind of like Khan. Like you're okay, we're building him up into this badass, but you gotta win too. So I I just think it benefits more for Alexander to win this match and just kind of go on a tear for a while until they're ready for him, because they're not gonna be ready for him as a heel champion anytime soon. With Josh, Josh, the problem is Josh has taken a few L's in the last few months. But his character is about bringing in random fucking good wrestlers and having good matches. So you can always heat Josh up. So I do think uh, th- that's going to be my narrative I push on that match. And when I get into more reviews or previews and stuff, I'll talk more about that. But, but yeah, with Jake something, they just heat him up when they need him. They're doing a better job of it this time around where he's uh, coming off a little more credible as a threat. And Ali is actually scared of him. You know, they're doing they're doing a good job with that. But I just think whoops, there it is. Every freaking dogs. Um they just gotta do something with Jake to make him look like he's not just some dude walking around in his shorts backstage. Uh Santino's in the ring after this, and they just cut to him very quickly. I, I can't take this dude seriously as an authority figure. It was one thing six months ago when there was a lot of bad comedy on screen there was there was the whole angle with him and dango you know dango was walking around as his assistant and then who attacked santino and uh, that oh, oh god that was bad but there was a lot of bad backstage comedy going on like him and his goofy character now he's coming out and he's having to find actual resolution in these angles you know what i mean like he's He's having to do the Scott Demore role of, of how do I how do I fix this? How do I book this show? How do I book the pay per view? And it doesn't. It, it's a huge miss for me doing it with a comedy character because they're trying to make him serious. Also, but that's not what got Santino over. You know, they think, oh, as long as we just use the accent, I'm like, no, not really. So it's it's a little hard to take serious. I didn't think this segment was was that bad. I actually kind of liked it. I think they needed it for Steph to lander. I think they needed to give her the opportunity to speak. Cardona came off a little little corny on here. I think they have to get back to the death match, Matt Cardona, because what I always said was that TNA wants him to be Zack Ryder. They don't want him to be Matt Cardona. That Matt Cardona that has done really good work in NWA and GCW and the Indies. Like that's not who they want. They want Zach Ryder that the WWE audience knows. So he always comes off very goofy on, on impact. But I, I thought this was really good. Um, well, not really good. I thought it was good. I thought Jordan Grace using the line of, you know, I beat you, your boyfriend and your boyfriend's wife. I thought that was excellent. And it was necess- this was just necessary because we've only seen, we've barely seen her on TV. She hasn't really won. Jordan beat her in like four minutes. It was nothing. And she's weight. She's like double Jordan's height. When they stood up, I'm like, oh my god. Um, I th- I think she's gonna win. At first, I was like, well, Jordan's gonna run through her, and then they're gonna get her, give her Ash, and then Ash is gonna win the title. I think Steph Delander is gonna win. I don't know how long she's going to hold the title, but uh, you know Jordan can get it back. But if you if you create a division because it's so it's bad right now, we keep saying the knockout division is very bad right now. There's no depth to it whatsoever. If she just runs through Steph Delander and then maybe runs through Astrid Elegance, you're just pushing her out the door to the WWE, where she has all these different opportunities of matches she can have. You're just pushing her out the door when the time comes. Because historically, people leave TNA even when they're happy, when they run out of things to do. And it happens more so with the knockouts, the Ty Valkyries, the Deanna Perrazzo's. It happens more there like, what else do you want me to do at this point? 
Like Rosemary should have done left a long time ago, but she's happy there. She's she's happier there than the other knockouts appear to be. She said, I mean, she says she's also not motivated by money because yeah, there's there's a point where you make money and what are you gonna do with it? You know, you can't possibly spend it all. So she's happy where she's at, but for the most part, the average pro wrestler may be a little more motivated by money. It, it, it's like when you're in a smaller company, eventually you're gonna run out of shit to do. So, you know, that's why I've I've said keep Josh out of the title picture for a while. But Jordan needs to lose this title at this point in order to spend some time chasing it. And they're kind of still trying to run. uh, They're they're still to this day trying to ride the wave of the Royal Rumble. The momentum like the Royal Rumble is over. The WWE is not even talking about the Royal Rumble. So I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking she, she might I think she might drop the title here. I, th- <laughs> you you guys know I hate street fights and all this shit. I wouldn't be opposed to this being a death match though, because Jordan has been the part of so many firsts: the Digital Media Joke Title, um, you know, Ultimate X, Queen of the Mountain, which I completely forgot about till she said it. Uh, I think she was part of the she wasn't the inaugural tag team champions, but she was she was in the mix there. She was like the second team second champion she's she's just her history like when they try to show that cody rhodes is history and tna bullshit you do a history of jordan grace it is it is going to be the you can do a dvd set on this shit talking about the jordan grace that showed up and the jordan grace that ultimately leaves because i don't think she's going to be there forever you can do so much i would i would put her in a fucking death match they haven't done anything like that and even though I hate no, you know the trash cans and the the, the cookie sheets, that's what a, not what a death match is. Like you're bringing out the, you know, there's, there's going to be real blood there, and there's there's going to be the light fixtures and and all that shit. I would do that. I think it would have people talking. EC3 and Matt Cardona did a death match on NWA, and it was fucking excellent. It's so it's something different. It's not you know most street fights and stuff are goofy. We're gonna get to that, but I, I would I would say fuck it, swing for the fence on this one, uh, because there's no interest otherwise in the match, so why not? But there are some other gimmicks on the show, so I don't know if there's room for it. But I would I wouldn't be against it. I would 100% freaking do that. That would be huge for Jordan Grace's, you know, TNA career, for all these firsts, and it's something a Steph Delander can do. And it would make sense because Steph couldn't beat her the first time. So why why wrestle again? You know what I'm saying? So it would be cool if they did that. Um, Matt, Masha was backstage with the system, so she's cutting her Russian promo. They're still trying to get her wrestling with uh, Alicia Edwards, which I'm all for. I need Alicia to have a title. Uh, bring bring it home. I consider myself part of the group at this point. You know, we need a title for Alicia. I don't think they, Alicia will ultimately be her partner, though. I think what's going to happen. So later in this, uh, you know, they establish it's going to be Decay versus Spitfire at Rebellion. Talk about a fucking ice cold match. I don't think anyone wants to see that. I, sh- I shouldn't say that. A lot of you guys want to see it. Spitfire hasn't even been on TV in several weeks. I mean, they're the, tra- the, the definition of transitional champion. And surely they're not putting the belt on Decay again. I mean, how many times are we going to do that? Like, we've gone to that well way too many times. Um, I think I think this ends up being like a four-way. I think they might announce it as a three-way where Masha is going to find a different partner. I think they're going to have this... Because there, there's so much opportunity for the knockouts right now to debut new wrestlers. There, yeah, You have to freaking imagine at rebellion there's going to be at least one there has to be so you can easily find masha a a japanese partner and have alicia inserted into the match debuted with with someone else and then win the title and then they can be they can be within the you know added to the system because masha slamovich is not gonna be part of the system i think it's easy to see that 
However, if if Alicia and Masha do end up as a team and they do win, I think the storylines, uh, it would freshen up the system a little bit. I think the storylines could be endless because Masha is going to have to, she's not going to be in a suit. I'd be like shocked if she was in a freaking suit and, you know, like a pantsuit. But storyline why she would have to interact with the system. And I think it could be very interesting television. Not that I love hearing her talk in Russian all the time, but I just mean the dynamic of, you know, this. I don't even know if she's a heel or baby face at this point. I think she they lent, she last ended up a heel. But uh, adding her to the system, or not to the system, but, but just storyline-wise, could ultimately turn her into a really, really strong baby face as a singles wrestler. So I'm kind of curious to see where they're going with it. Then we got another Gresham video. I don't know if I understand what the gimmick is quite yet. He's in a room with a bunch of independent wrestlers. They had a bunch of independent wrestlers in the opening scene. I forgot to talk about this. Josh jumped over the top rope, took a bunch of security guys out. They're independent wrestlers. Independent wrestlers are getting work on this episode because they got the opening. They got... Jonathan Gresham segment because there's like he's in a room of a bunch of jacked guys. Come on, and then in the very end as well. So they they got their work in <laughs> this episode. But more of this. I said this last week. More of this. More, more, more. And I mean not just him, but other people. Moose took on Trent Seven. Easily beats Trent Seven. Seven. And these two. Speedball Mountain look like a couple of goofs before their title match at Rebellion. They've lost pretty much every ever since they have formed, whether it's a tag team or single, they've pretty much lost every time they've been out there. They have a couple wins, but they've pre, they have they have more losses than wins. They're, they have no business. This is like spitfire for the guys. They have no business putting the titles on them. But logic says they're going to win, right? Because Speedball lost to Eddie Edwards. Seven went a kick out. Trent Seven lost to Moose. I thought Trent Seven was going to wrestle Brian Myers and beat him, and, and then you're 50-50. He wrestles Moose. Moose beats the shit out of him. This isn't even a fucking match. It shouldn't have been a match. It was exactly what it needed to be. So if Speedball Mountain loses, which they should at Rebellion, they're going to look like the biggest goofs in the world. And then what do you do with them at that point? Do they turn on each other and you just break up another tag team? So th- I don't know what the hell they're going they're going to do here. I don't know what they're going with. I mean, I like that it's not predictable, but I worry that it actually is predictable and that Speedball Mountain's going to win the titles. There's no no reason to take any titles off the system. They should be adding titles to the system. They should find a way to get the digital media championship in there. Like they should have them all as far as I'm freaking concerned. Watch Laredo kid win the title and, 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 and if I can put on a suit and join the system. So, um, yeah, man, I, it's, it's, it's like, I'm thinking of it in my head. I'm like, I don't know what they're doing here. I'm learning to not question the booking so much. Because they have been doing some really good long-term stuff that I've been like dissing early on. And I'm, I'm trying to like pull back on that and not jump to conclusions. But I'm very worried they're going to put the titles on these guys. No reason to do it. None. None, 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 none. I don't care. There's not a single good reason out there to put the titles on these guys. And then they did this angle backstage that the machine guns are going to wrestle the system and the winner is going to out of here and then we got james drake i had to write the name down i won't remember it tomorrow um take on jake something the match was pretty quick i would have liked to see jake wrestle the other dude because he's bigger and they're trying to well no 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 no. not true because he's wrestling for the x division championship so they you know you got to put him against the smaller dude i am coming around on him like i said the match was what it was. Cody Deaner comes out. And there's an interesting dynamic here because they were the Deaners together. Cousin Jake and Cody Deaner. 
So now there's an interesting dynamic. Are these guys going to team up? I thought it was funny when Matt Ray, when he came out to interfere in the match and Matt Ray Wall said, the, the, the people ask him to do this because he's already pointing out you're getting outside of the gimmick because he says he's only going to do what the people tell him to do. Um, but whatever, it's, it's, it's minor, minuscule, not that big of a deal. He is the lower card fucking wrestler. Um, but I, I want to say I thought the way he hit the into the void was really cool. He just kind of short arm, short arm clothesline hit him with it. It wasn't off the ropes or anything. So the match was what it was. And then Ali comes out with a bunch of indie guys again, and they do the same exact spot that they did in the opening where someone jumps over the top rope and does the cannonball thing and knocks over all the guys, which is one of my least favorite things in wrestling. Because in real life, if someone was jumping over and you had two people, you could put your hands up and, and shoulder the blow and not fall over. Maybe two. If you add the three, I promise you could catch the motherfucker. There's like six or seven. It it's one of the fakest thing that they they do in wrestling and they did it twice on this episode what i mean is jake something jumping over the top rope sentoning onto the guys with the signs the independent wrestlers but they're still doing a good story here i don't want to i don't want to take away that the storyline that they got going on they're they are building some intrigue into this match all he's going to win all he's not going to lose i don't know who the hell is going to beat him to be totally honest gonna be suicide that's their they need a he's gonna open challenge and suicide's gonna come out win the title um i don't know who's gonna ultimately beat him but it's not gonna be jake something but it's gonna be a good match and and just the fact that they're doing some kind of storyline is the x division here it's good they're doing a good job with it then they showed a video package of steve macklin and, and nick nemeth are gonna fight again at immersed i don't know what immersed is i don't know if it's a television show i don't know if it's a monthly show i don't know what it is I don't even know if it's a show. I don't, I don't know if it just said the word immersed. I have no idea, but Nick Nemeth must have a sweet fucking deal because he doesn't have to show up, but, but the first set of every set of tapings and he's probably making a lot of money and then they just have to <laughs> pretend he's there the rest of the time. So he's got a, He's got a pretty sweet deal. Main event time. We get con <laughs> the moment. Everyone's been waiting for con versus PCO three. And um, for Monsters Ball, they do this, you know, you're locked up for 24 hours without food or water or light. If you lock me up for 24 hours in a dark room, like, I'm going to get the best sleep of my life. Like, I'm, I'm going to come out f- fresh as a daisy, you know, like, let's attack the world. What what can we do today? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They, they come out like, you know, come out, Khan comes out fake blinded. Even though you know he probably came across several lights on his way to the ring, but I get, I get they got to do what they got to do. They have a garbage match. They in, immediately reach for for garbage under the ring. When they announced this match, I didn't want to see it. I'm not crying over it. Like I actually don't dislike Khan that much. I actually kind of like him. I'm not the world's biggest PCO fan. I've said that many times. You know, but, but but they're like they're having a decent match. It's whatever. But people were telling me on social media, "Oh no, this was a good match." Maybe it's just the live experience because I know with me the live experience when I was there this time around, I, I probably thought stuff was better than it really was. It's really hard. It, they're two completely different experiences: TV and and being there in person. I didn't think this was good. I didn't. I didn't. Um, let me not say it was it wasn't good. It wasn't bad. I just don't think it was when people are like, no, you, you really want to see this match. Like, I didn't see anything in it that I'm going to freaking write to my grandmother in Puerto Rico about. You know, this was amazing. Uh, it ultimately, I just wanted it to be over. It didn't need to get to this point. I don't even know why they did. Khan never beat this dude. Why do they keep wrestling? Why won't it stop? Make the bleeding stop. <clears throat> if you wanted to build Khan, you have Khan win the first match and then go from there. This tells me Khan is probably done with the company. They were probably, you know, I, I, my gut fucking says, they say, hey, we're not going to renew you, um, but we're going to break you off from the design. 
give you a chance to build your character up a little bit for wherever you, if you want to go at NWA, MLW next, which I think he would do very well there at both of those companies. You know, if you want to build this baddest man thing up a little bit, whatever you want to do. Um, but we're going to put PCO over. Like, PCO needs to fucking get over. This dude doesn't lose. But anyway, uh, I have to believe that's Khan's last match because he's he's dead in the water. There's, you can't do anything with him at this point. I, I had said after the first match, you can't heat him up any further. They had three matches. He lost all three. Granted, one was by disqualification. But he never beat this dude. I couldn't believe PCO won this match. When when he put the tax in PCO's mouth mouth and was going to do the neckbreaker gimmick, I said, you know what? Even though I said you can't heat Khan up, you can heat him up a little bit if he hits this. Like This would get over. This was kind of cool. PCO gets out of it. I don't know if he spit him into Khan's eyes or threw him, but he blinds him. Blinds him enough to, like, this would not blind me. I know that thumbtacks are sharp, but this would not blind me. If you're just throwing this shit in my eyes, you know, I'd be like, oh, what a what a minor inconvenience. But he takes a uh, con down, pours the tax over him, and then does the PCO salt and wins. There's no way PC uh, con is coming back after this. We didn't need to do all this. I don't know why PCO needs all these wins all the time. He's in the mid card, will never be the world champion, but he's fucking unbeatable. The last thing I want to say before I sign off, is there any evidence to assume that the people of Philadelphia want garbage matches? I understand the history with ECW. I get it. They went out of business like 25 years ago. Is there any evidence that the people who live there now who watch wrestling want to see kendo sticks and trash cans and baking sheets and fake fights? I think I think they would be cool with good wrestling. I I don't I don't think you have to appeal with the Tommy Dreamers and the Monsters Balls and old school rules. I don't think I, I don't know that there's any evidence out there that supports that 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 audience wants that. So if you guys live out there, I think my guy Pat lives out there. Let me know. If you want to show like, is that what you want to see from from TNA or from wrestling in general? Like, do you do you want to see that those kind of matches? Because like I said, it it went out of town a long uh, went out of business a long time ago. I know TNA has older fans, but I know I certainly don't. I was around for ACW. Like it, it was they were good at what they did. I I don't want to see that now. You guys got to let me know. Longer review for me today, but thanks for checking me out, folks. I'm your boy, BQ. Going to wrap it up, and I will talk to you guys again next time. Peace.